In this section, I'll be talking about DNS, writing a DNS server and resolver in Go. First of all, what is DNS? Simply said, DNS provides a translation between host names and IP addresses. For example, if you type in your browser www.google.com, which is a host name, a DNS server will translate that in the IP address. So the IP address now, when I tested it on my machine, is 142.250.114.99, but if you would test this on your machine, it could be already another IP address. How do you test this on your machine? You can use tools like NSLOCKUP on Windows or HOST or DIG on macOS or Linux to do the translation of a hostname to an IP address. Typically, the laptop or desktop you are working on has one or more IP addresses from your internet provider to run DNS queries. So the server that you can call to do these DNS queries is typically provided by your internet provider. In Linux and macOS, this you're going to find in etcresolve.conf and on Windows, it's going to be in the DNS server settings. You can check this with ipconfig or you can go to the network settings on a Microsoft Windows machine. So even if you are not using any tooling yourself to translate the host name to an IP address, whenever you are using your browser, you type in google.com, the browser will automatically translate the host name to an IP address using a DNS server. So DNS is something very common that you do in the background on a daily basis. So how does a DNS request look like? So you have your browser on one side. Your browser is going to do a lookup for, for example, google.com. And it's going to do this lookup using a DNS resolver. So your internet service provider DNS resolver will be used or other public DNS resolvers like 8.8.8.8 or 4.4.4.4, which is provided by Google. So it's not because we are doing google.com. It's just something that Google provides. Google provides a public DNS server that you can set up and use instead of your internet service provider DNS resolver. Or you can also use 1.1.1.1 and that one is maintained by Cloudflare, which is not a company. You can also set up this IP address as your DNS resolver and then you'll be able to resolve host names using that DNS resolver that is running on that IP address. So every time your browser is going to go to google.com and we wouldn't know the IP address yet because once you know it, you can cache it. But if you don't know it yet, then it's going to make a call to this DNS server to obtain the IP address for google.com. This DNS server doesn't really know where to find the IP address of google.com immediately. So it will have to go to something that's called the root servers. All the DNS resolvers will have these root servers configured in their DNS resolver settings. So they will have a config file somewhere where they have the IP addresses of these root servers. These are the IP addresses that need to be known to be able to start DNS resolving. So this DNS resolver will then go to one of these root servers and it will ask, what do you know about google.com? It can ask what do you know about google.com or it can ask what do you know about .com because the root servers will not know where to find google.com but they will only know the top level domain, the TLD. So as a DNS resolver, you can actually choose to send google.com to the root servers or just .com. So we're going to ask, do you know about google.com? And they will say, no, I don't know anything about google.com. I am not authoritative for that. Try.com at IP addresses. So the root server will say, google.com, I don't know about, but I can tell you where to go to get information about .com domain names. So the root servers only know where to find the servers of the top level domains. And it will reply the host names and IP addresses of those servers. So then our DNS resolver knows that it can go to another server, specific servers for .com domain names. And that is then what the DNS resolver will do. The DNS resolver will then go to these top level domain servers 
and it will ask, do you know something about google.com? I want to know what the IP address is. And the TLD servers for .com will then answer, I'm not authoritative for google.com, but the google.com name servers, the google.com DNS servers, you'll be able to find at this IP address. It can also say you can find them at these host names, and then you would still need to do more lookups to know the IP address of those host names. But in the most simple example, it's just going to give us the IP address, and then we can just go to this IP address where the name servers for google.com are. So these are the google.com name servers. And then we're going to ask again, what is the IP address for google.com? And the Google name server is going to say, yes, I have the IP address of google.com. I am authoritative for this domain name, so I can give you this IP address. And then the DNS resolver will then be able to send to the browser the IP address is this IP address that I found for google.com. The DNS resolver will then typically cache all these IP addresses. How long depends on another field that is being passed. There's a time to live, TTL, that is also passed. So that TTL will say how long these records can stay in cache and the DNS resolver will then keep them in cache so that it doesn't always have to go to those servers because google.com, for example, or just the com TLD are queried quite a lot, so it doesn't really need to go to the root servers every time. It can often skip some servers because they already resolved domain names earlier. But this is the most typical flow where the DNS resolver first goes to the root server, figures out where the top level domain is, then goes to one of the top level domain servers, and then they will give you a host name or a host name and IP address. And then you will be able to go to the name servers for that domain name and they will give you an authoritative answer that then can be sent back to the client. So what are those root servers? So those root servers are machines hosted by operators, companies that maintain these servers. These IP addresses, they don't change that often or at all. So they are all configured within these DNS resolvers. There is a website where you can also go to to get the latest list. So that list you download as a config file in your DNS server and these IP addresses you will have to statically configure to be able to know where the root servers are so that you can use them as a starting point. So it's not that every machine, every laptop or PC has this list. They typically have these DNS resolver configured and the DNS resolver will then reach out to those root servers. It's not typically the browser itself that will do that. The browser will just use a resolver that then can handle any DNS resolving for the browser or the user on the machine. Also maybe interesting to note is that even if you see a single IP address here, one IP address is not equal to one server. There are actually multiple servers scattered around the globe that are representing this IP address. So there's also routing in effect that routes you to the closest root server in your region. So there will be multiple servers responsible to be able to handle requests for a single IP address that you see here. How does a DNS packet look like? So before we are going to start writing this DNS resolver in Go, let's have a look how a DNS packet really looks like so that we know a little bit more in detail how the protocol works so we can then easily implement it. Once we'll start writing our Go program, we are not going to parse the DNS packet ourselves. We are going to use a library that is available within Golang for that. So don't worry if you don't fully grasp all the concepts that I'm going to explain because we will still be able to use this package that comes with Go to be able to pack and unpack these DNS packets. So a DNS packet can be sent to the resolver using UDP or TCP. So if you are a browser, then you can send a DNS packet to the resolver and the packet can be UDP or TCP. So the difference between UDP and TCP is that TCP needs a handshake, so it takes a bit longer to get an answer. The handshake within TCP gives you an extra bit of latency, whereas UDP is stateless, it's just one single packet, so there's much less latency to get an answer. 
A DNS UDP packet cannot be larger than 512 bytes. This to avoid the UDP packet being fragmented over multiple packets. Everything larger than that need to be sent over TCP. Let's focus solely on UDP packets to be able to write a simple DNS resolver server. So when we are going to write our DNS server, our resolver, we are only going to do the UDP implementation. So we will not be able to take any packets larger than 512 bytes because that's the maximum. You could use the same mechanism to then also implement TCP later on, but I'm just going to explain the concept and we're going to keep it simple. So we're going to just do UDP. So what is a DNS packet? How does it look like? So our browser will do a lookup and it will use a resolver. It will send a DNS packet using mostly UDP and this DNS packet consists of headers. There will be headers and then actual data. So the actual data, which is going to be the questions and answers, I'm going to go over later. Let's start just with the headers. This DNS packet headers is going to be the same whether it's a question or an answer. So if the browser sends a lookup to a resolver, it's going to have these headers here. And if the resolver sends something back, it's also going to have these headers that I'm showing. So it's not that they have different headers for requests and responses. It's going to be the same format headers. They're just going to have different values. So the headers start with a query ID, which is 16 bits long. This is just a unique ID that is used to send a request. When the resolver then answers, it will also use the same query ID so that the browser that did the lookup will know that this is an answer for this specific query ID. On the next row, you will then have flags. You can find the explanation of these flags online if you want to know where every flag stands for. We are going to use this AA code here. So authoritative answer. If a server sends an authoritative answer, then this flag will be set. And this is something we will need to check on to know whether we reached the server that can give us the correct answer or whether we have to reach out to other servers. Then the QR, for example, is question or response. So this one will be set to one if it's a response or a zero if it's a question. Then we have our code, which is a result code, which can contain an error code if there's an error. And there's also TC for truncation. If this is used, this flag needs to be set to one. And then you have recursion desired and recursion available. Recursion means that if the service is not authoritative, that it will itself then go reach out to the authoritative server to get the request. So a resolver is actually recursive because the resolver will go to the different servers to find you the answer. If it wouldn't be recursive, then if you would ask for google.com, it would just say, I'm not authoritative for this domain name. So here's an error. Because it is doing recursive lookups, it will actually go and find the correct server for you and find you the answer. This Z here is also reserved, so we are not going to use this. There are some other flags as well. For example, the R code here, the result code. If there's an error code, then this flag will be set, for example. So these are the flags, and then you also have more information in this header. You have the question count. So if the browser is going to look up one host name, then the question count will be one. The answer count, if it's an answer, it can be higher than zero. If it's a question only, then the answer will be zero. The name server count, so this is going to be necessary if we cannot get the answer from the server, but the server knows other name servers where we can get the answer from, then this will be set. And this is just a count. So this is a field that just counts how many occurrences we will have in the data part of our packet. And then we have the additional count, the number of additional resource records. So this counter is showing how many additional records that we have. For example, this can be IP addresses. If we have the name service available, then the name service will only be the host names. If we also have the IP addresses, then it will be available in the additional records. And here we just have the count of those records. 
So this is just the header. Now we can have glued together within the same packet also the questions and the answers. So this can be our header for the lookup and then we're going to have also questions. So then attached to the same packet we're going to have this question part and this part is going to have a question name the DNS name to resolve. So in, in this case it's going to be google.com. Names are split into labels and start with the length of the label first and end with a zero, a zero octet. So it's going to be double zero if you are reading it in hexadecimal. For example, if you have www.google.com, you will see three, which is the first part, the first label, that's the length of three, www is length of three, then six, because Google has six letters, so the length of Google is six, and then three more, because then there is com, and then it ends with a zero. And in hexadecimal, this will be zero, zero. Then we're going to have a question type, which in our case is going to be an A record, but it can also be an MX record. MX record is for emails. So if you want to know the email server where to send the emails to, then you will ask for the MX record. Otherwise, you will ask for an A record. The A record is for IPv4. If you have four A's, you're going to ask for an IPv6 record. And then you're going to have the class, the question class, and that's going to be typically internet address. So there's a code for internet address and that is the code that we're going to use. So this question packet together with the header is going to be sent to the resolver. We're also going to have an answer part of the packet and that's going to be attached to the question, but it's going to be empty because we don't really have an answer when we are only asking the question, what is the IP address of google.com? So let's have a look at an example packet. Let's say that we want to do a lookup for www.google.com. Then we're going to have the header, the question, and the answer within our packet. So the header is going to have a unique ID. 59E2 is our ID in hexadecimal format. Then we're going to have our flags, which will include that recursion is desired, and that we have one question. Within our question, we'll then find this length three, which represents three times W, then length six for Google, length three for com, and then it's also going to pass the type and the class, and type A for the A record is going to be one, so in hexadecimal it's going to be one, and the class is also going to be one. So this is how our question is going to look like. So this 363 three for the label is just to make it easy to parse. So programmatically, this needs to be parsed. And because this field doesn't have set length, like the header, we also need some help to know where the field starts or ends. And these lengths, they help us with that. We will not have to do this ourselves. So like I was already saying, we have a package in Golang that will parse this for us. Even though it's going to be parsed for us, it is actually very beneficial to have this schema in mind so that when we are going to be digging into this package that you have an ID what the information is that is available in the header, what is available in the question and what's going to be available in the answer. So let's now have a look at the answer packet. So the answer packet is going to come back from the resolver to the browser. So the answer packet is going to have the name as well, which is the same format as the question name in the question packet. So if you ask for google.com, then it will also send back google.com. Also, the answer packet will have the same headers. So this packet that comes back, I'm only showing the answer part of this packet. It will still also have the headers and the questions in the same packet. So we have the name, the type, the type is going to be a record. The type can be a record, mx record, or something else. The class, the time to live. So if anyone is caching this record, how long can we cache this record? That's what the time to live is going to tell us in seconds. The response data length, so how long is the response going to be? And then the response data. So response data for an A record is an IP address. So first we are going to say how long this IP address is, and then we're going to actually put straight after that the response data. So what does the packet look like? We are going to have the same ID in the header. We're going to have again the header, the question and the answer. 
in the header we're going to have the same ID, but then our header, our flags will look a bit different. You will see here the hexadecimal representation of the flags, which are not the same ones as when we were sending the question, because here we are setting, for example, that we have one answer available. We then have the original question in our question packet. So google.com is still here. And we then have the answer for google.com, the IP address. So the answer from your resolver can come back like this. The first cell here, C00C, is actually a pointer that is saying the name can be found at the position 00C, and that's going to refer exactly to google.com in our question data. So that way we don't have to repeat the name in the answer. So there's a mechanism to make the packets smaller. Then we have the type, so it's an A record, so it's going to be one, the class is also going to be one, the time to live, so this is the representation of time to live. If you would convert this hexadecimal number to just a number, then you would get the amount of seconds that you can cache this entry. Then how long is the response going to be? The response is going to be four bytes, so 16 bits, so eight hexadecimal letters. And if you would take those eight hexadecimal letters and convert this again, then you would see the IP address that starts with 142. So this is an example answer packet that could come back from the Google server that then the resolver sends back to the browser. So if you would like to know exactly what is in this header, then you would need to expand these hexadecimal numbers because you would need to see on a bit level whether a certain flag is set to 0 or 1 to see what flags have been set. So lastly, Go packages. Luckily, Go has packages available to parse those DNS packets. So we don't have to do it ourselves. Golang.org X for extra net DNS, DNS message is the package that can be used to unpack, which is decode and pack and code DNS packets. So when a DNS packet comes in over UDP, those bytes can then be parsed by this packet. And that way we don't have to manually go and try to parse this binary data. We have this package available to us to do that for us. And then we just can use this DNS message to extract the information that we need to build our resolver. So then we still need the net package that can be used to listen for UDP packets and send UDP packets to other DNS servers. So those are the main packages that we would need in our program to then write a DNS server that can resolve host names if you would send a query to it. And that's what I will show you in the Next lecture, in the next lecture, I will show you how to build a DNS resolver in Go. Before we start writing our DNS server, our resolver in Go, let's go over the logical flow diagram so that we get an idea of what we are going to create. How is our resolver going to look like? Well, we are going to have to listen to UDP so we're going to create a UDP socket on port 53. Port 53 is the DNS port. We'll then have a client that is going to connect to our UDP port on our machine and the client is going to send a packet. So we need to handle this packet. Whenever a new packet comes from a client, we need to handle it and we can then start parsing it. So we can use this DNS message package from Golang to make it easy to parse a DNS packet, but we still need to figure out what fields we need to extract and have a look at. So the question part of the packet looks like this. It will have a question name, for example, www.google.com, question type, what do we need to know for this name, for this host name? We need, for example, an A record, the question class, and for us, it's always going to be an internet address. Let's go in a little bit more detail. So we're going to parse our question. And then we're going to create a for loop. We are going to 
do a few actions in a loop until a certain condition is met. We are first going to query the server. The first DNS server that we're going to query is going to be the root server or one of the root servers. When the DNS package comes back from the root server, we are going to ask a question, is the answer authoritative? Yes or no? If it is yes, the first iteration of the loop, it will never be because we are asking the root server and the root server is always going to redirect us to another server. But this is part of our loop. If it is yes, then we can send the answer back to the client. If the answer is no, and if we are sending a query to the root server, it's going to be no, then we need to parse the authorities section in the DNS packet that comes back from the root server to get the new servers. So those servers are going to be the name servers for, for example, .com. So once we have these new servers, we'll have to again query the server, but instead of querying the root servers, we are going to query this new server, this new authority that our root server gave us in this DNS packet that we now know and that we now can query. So let me quickly show you with a DNS tool how this actually works. So I have a tool called dick and I can use dick trace google.com and it's going to show me the trace of all the queries that you would need to do so the first query is going to be to the root servers so these are the root servers a root server.net you saw these names on the slide so we will query these these root servers and we'll ask where can i find .com or google.com typically you send less data to a DNS server, so it's just going to be .com. And the query would then go to one of the root servers. And the root server would then say, here, look, these are the name servers. And it's going to be in this authority section. So here we have a.gtldservers.net. And these are going to be then the servers that we can query. And then we can go to these servers and ask, where is google.com? And then they say google.com, you can find those at ns1google.com, ns2.google.com, and so on. And then we can go to one of these name servers that belong to Google, and then we can get our A record. So these would then be a few iterations in our for loop to get eventually to the IP address. There's just one detail missing here. And when we say, is the answer authoritative? Then we say no, then we're gonna parse the authorities to get the new servers. Any server that we're going to query might actually not give us the IP addresses. So the authorities only contain host names. We might get IP addresses, but we also might not get the IP addresses. So let's have another look in this for loop in more detail. So we have the query server, is the answer authoritative? No. Then we're going to parse the authorities to get the new servers. These are typically the host names. And then we're going to parse the additional resources. And in those additional resources, which is part of the DNS packet, we are going to find the IP addresses if the server, the DNS server, is going to give them to us in this DNS packet. So here we have to ask ourselves again a question. Is the IP address included? If yes, then we have the IP address and we can query the next server and do another iteration of our loop. But if it's not included, then we have to start the whole loop function again to query the A record of the name server. For example, if the name server is ns1google.com, then we have to start the whole loop again. So typically, when we are going to query google.com and google.com has a name server within the same domain name, they will supply the IP addresses. But if Google is using another name server of another domain, 
it might as well not supply the IP addresses. If we are querying google.com and the name server is ns1google.com, then typically the IP addresses will be supplied because otherwise there's no way of knowing the IP address because we would just end up in an indefinite loop. It's often that when we could query google.com and the name server would not be in the google.com domain name, it would be something completely different. For example, it would run another company for some reason, then the IP address might not be known and then we would have to do a lookup. So then we have to start a new loop. We kind of have to go again in the same function to do a lookup of this domain name. Here with google.com, the IP address is actually supplied, so we could immediately query the new server, but with other domain names, it's not always the case. So a domain name XYZ might have an Amazon name server, and then we have to look up the amazon.com domain name, get the IP address, and then only we can continue. So once we have this IP address of this ns1google.com or some other host name, then we can actually continue, because then the IP address we have, and then we can go to yes and create a new server with that IP address. So this will become more clear once we start writing the code. You just have to remember that we are going to parse the authorities to get these servers. We're going to parse additional resources to get the IP addresses. If the IP address is not included, we are going to have to do more queries. If the IP address is included, we can just continue our loop and create a new server that we have found. Let's now have a look how to write this DNS server, which will be our resolver in Go. I opened my DNS start project that comes from my github.com repository, Golang for DevOps course. And in this DNS start project, I have a CMD, DNS resolver. So to start my project, I will enter something like go run cmd dns resolver main.go which just says starting the dns server there's no code yet so here i will have to write my code to start the server to listen to udp packets then i will have a package the resolver.go and this resolver.go it has the root service defined so that you don't have to copy paste it in there. And I will keep it up to date if there's a IP that would ever change, then I will update it here. And this resolver.go has the function handle packet. So we can start a server in main.go, but then we can use the function handle packet in this DNS package to handle an incoming packet. The benefit of doing it like this is that I also wrote a test file. Here I have this test file to test this test handle packet where I will try to resolve two host names and if it returns an error, then it will stop. So if I execute this now, then serve error not implemented yet because I have the error not implemented yet returned here. Within this handle packet, we will also have to contact other DNS servers. And for that, we have the outgoing DNS query. And for this outgoing DNS query, which will make a DNS query to a server, defined here in the parameters, for that, I also have the test outgoing DNS query test, where we test whether we can reach the root servers, and we're going to try, try to resolve the com which we know that we can resolve that we're going to ask for the name server type so we're going to ask the root server what is the name server for dot com just as a test and if that works then our test will succeed so right now doesn't work we have no header found because the header is nil because we are just returning nil so these tests, they test these two functions. So if you use this start package with these functions, it's easy to actually test whether your code works. I also have this mock packet con because that's what I'm passing here. I'm asking 
for a packet connection. So this is an interface for a packet connection because we will have to use this variable here, this PC to send something back to the client. So we can send a UDP packet back and that's why we have this. So I'm just mocking this so that we can test this function without having to send a package back. Well, we will trigger sending a package back in this function, but nothing will really happen if we mock this function. So I'll first start with this function, it should be relatively easy, outgoing DNS query, where we're just going to contact over UDP another DNS server. And next I will then start the server and then start working on the handle packet code. And then when everything is finished, the test should also succeed. Let's start with this outgoing DNS query. Let's have a look at our signature. So we have servers. Servers is a slice of net IP. So net IP represents an IP address. It's in type bytes. So we'll have to convert a string IP address into bytes if you want to use this. But that is actually quite easy. If we have a look here, we have the function net parse that can take a string and it returns a net IP address. So we have our servers, it can be the root server, it can be the Google name server, it can be the Amazon name server, it can be the name server for the .com TLDs, for example. And then we have the question. And the question is of type DNS message question. So I was saying that we are going to use this DNS message package. So a DNS message question is a question struct that contains a name, type, and class, just like I showed you what a question really contains in a packet. So it contains a name, the type, and the class, and that's what we need to then ask a question to an external DNS server. We are going to return the DNS message parser, which will then give us access to the packet that is being returned from the server. It will also return the header, just like I showed you in the slides, the header contains an ID, a response, which is a flag, operation code, whether it's authoritative or not, whether it's truncated, recursion desired, recursion available, authentic data, checking disabled, and the R code. So this is the header of the packet. This is the parser where we can then get more information from the packet. So if we're going to trigger this, this outgoing DNS query, then we can trigger this with a question. Here's our question, DNS message question. It has a name, type NS, and a class, and then it's going to call this outgoing DNS query using this server, which is the first of our root server, because we just kind of split them based on the comma here, and here it is comma separated IP addresses. And we're going to take the first IP address, parse this, and then pass this net IP address to outgoing DNS query together with our question. So what are the next steps that we need to do to then actually reach out to the server and ask this question? We have to start by sending a UDP packet to the server. And what are we going to put in this packet? Well, we're going to put a DNS packet in there. And to put a DNS packet in there, we need to craft our message and package it, and then we'll be able to send it. So let's start with making our message. So our message is going to be of type DNS message message, which is a struct. And in this struct, we can put our header and our question. So this is going to be our DNS packet. So we have the header. If we have a look at this message, we have the header, questions, answer, authorities, and additionals. To send a question to a server, we only need those two, the header and the questions. Questions is a slice, and I already have my questions available here. So the header is of type header. What do I need? I need an ID for sure. And I need to say that it's going to be a question, so response is going to be false, so I don't need to enter anything. So what I might do is, just for clarity, add a few of these headers, like is the response 
no, it's false, but then it's clear that this is a question. Let's start with the ID because it also comes here first. And the ID is an unsigned int 16. So you want to return a random number between zero and the maximum unsigned int 16. What is this maximum? We can actually use the variable max and assign this u int 16 zero with this flag in front of it, which will return the maximum possible unsigned int 16. So this max will have the maximum unsigned int 16 in this max variable. And then the next step would be to use the crypt rand library to generate a number between zero and this max unsigned in 16. How do we do that? We have the run library and then this one shows math run, but we need crypto run. We need an integer. This needs a random reader and then we need to supply a big integer and it then returns a big integer, which we then have to cast back to an unsigned integer and an error if there's an error. So rand reader and then big has a new int, new int, which accepts an int 64. So we can say int 64 of this max. We change this type from an unsigned int to an int 64. Now we have the maximum here defined and we can say random number error is run int. If there's an error, return the error. If there's no error, we would still need to convert the random number to an unsigned integer. So unsigned 16 of this random number but this random number is of big int. So random number has actually a function to return an int 64. And then once we have an int 64, we can convert it to an unsigned int. So it's a lot of steps just to get the right format. But then we have exactly this ID in the unsigned int. 16 because that's a type that it asks. What's next? Let's have a look in this header again. Opcode, opcode, and opcode is a DNS operation code. So this opcode, if you're going to have a look in this package, then we see that opcode is of type opcode and it's also uh, unsigned in 16. An opcode is a DNS operation code and we typically just use a static value for this which is just going to be zero. So we can use DNS message opcode as a function to change the type of this zero to opcode. So now we are changing this zero here to type opcode. So we're using this type opcode to match the correct type. And this is just going to be zero. What else? We can leave it like that. I'm not even sure if we really need those last two fields because probably the defaults will be zero and false anyways. It just to make it clear that we need these set like this. So we have the message, we have the header, then we have the questions. So here we have one question. So we can say DNS message question and we have only one question. So this is a slice of the type question and we only supply one question. Now this message is of DNS message message and this DNS message message is a struct and has the back function which returns the bytes. So now we can just say buffer error equals message.pack 
and now we can use this buffer to send to our DNS server. If there's an error, we're going to return it. So how do we make a connection to our server? We can even have multiple servers. So we should do this in a loop for server in range servers. We can use net dial. So net dial, dial connects to the address on the name network. No networks are TCP and also UDP, UDP. So we can say we are going to make a UDP connection to a certain address. The address is the server and this is of type net IP and this needs to be of string. So we're just going to use a string function and we're going to do this on port 53 because that's a DNS port. So dial here are some examples. So here's an example for DNS. This is an IPv6, but we are going to use IPv4. So we are doing dial, and what does dial return? A connection and an error. Our connection, we probably want outside our for loop. So I'm going to say var con is net con, con and error equals net dial. If there's an error, we are going to continue. So if there's no error, then we can break. And if there's an error, then we will just continue until we hit a server that actually works. So we then just need to check our if. So we either then need to check our error or our connection. So if connection is still nil, there's no connection made, then we can return an error. Fail to make connection to server servers. I will just say, what is the error? Return nil, nil, and then the error. So now that we know that we have a connection, we can write something to our connection. So we can use con write accepts bytes. Here's our buffer. And then it will return the bytes that it has written and the error. So if there's an error, then we're going to return the error. If there's no error, we're going to read the bytes from our connection. Let's have a look at this connection. So read and write and close. So we can use a reader, a Golang reader, a stream reader to read this out. I can use buff IO, new reader of this connection. And then I can read this into a variable, reads data into P. So I just need to define a variable where our answer will go in. I can make a new byte and it's not going to be more than 512 bytes because it's a maximum. And I can read my answer. So read will read data into P, P is my answer, and it returns the amount of bytes that it has read and the error. So if there's an error, I will return it. And now I can try to parse this again with our DNS message, because this, what we get back, this answer, should be a DNS message. Before I'm going to do that, I can actually close the connection just to make sure that we close it already because we don't need it anymore. We just want packet so we can close it. And then I need this DNS message 
and the, the next match it has a parser parser is a struct so now this is all going to be empty and our parser has a function to start parser allows incrementally parsing a dns message when parsing is started the header is parsed next each question can be either parsed or skipped alternatively all questions can be skipped at once so basically because we are doing it incrementally we can say first start then we get a header and then we get the questions if we start with the questions if we don't need the questions we do skip questions which is here skip questions or skip all questions so that we can either go to the next questions if there's more or skip all the questions if you want to go to the answers all answers authorities and additionals can be either parsed or skipped in the same way and each type of resource must be fully parsed or skipped before proceeding to the next type of resource so this is a funny way to use this package but this parser is very much optimized so it's not going to read the data that you might not need so first you read the headers because the headers come first then the questions if you don't need the questions you can skip the questions and then you can start reading the answers and you can do the same then afterwards with the authorities and the additionals know that there is no requirement to fully skip or parse the message so if you just need the, he the headers you don't need to skip anything or if you only want to read the questions you don't need to skip the questions you can just read the questions so this is the parser so we're gonna say p is our parser p has start and accepts our bytes our bytes are an answer so we're gonna say answer but are we going to send all the bytes to our parser because we only actually need the bytes that we have read so this is 512 big but our message message might only be 100 bytes so we're gonna stop at n because that's what we have read so if you read only 100 bytes we get the first 100. this gives us the headers and an error so headers error if there was an error we just return mmt error f so it's clear if there's an error parser start error the error and then we could use the headers now what we could do is we can check the header whether our headers contains what we want and we can also check the question whether our question contains the question information that we we're looking for and if that is all okay we would then return the parser so that we can later on use it so we're going to return the parser and we're also going to return the header so that we can also use the header later on so those are the headers or is it header it's actually is it header or headers it's a header so that way we can then use the header and the parser later on if after calling this function what else do we need we might want to do some checks here whether we have a success response code or not so let's maybe do that first then test it and then write some more checks just so that we can do some basic checks for example whether we have the same question as we asked for so before i'm going to return the parser i already want to check the questions because there might be something wrong in the questions and we want to do these checks first then skip the questions and then when we return this function we can immediately continue with the answers so the questions are p questions or could be all questions P all questions and 
Now, if I want, I can check whether we have the same question. So we can, I can say len questions is equal to my original message questions. So here I can also check the length. So that my original message is here on top. So do I have the same amount of questions returned that I started with? If not, I can return an error because then something went wrong. And then I can say, okay, now I did my question checks. Now I'm going to skip the questions, skip all questions. And this only returns an error. So here, just between all questions and skip all questions, I can do my question checks. If I want to check these things, for example, I can check now whether the question name is equal to the original name. And then I skip them. And now next I'll be able to return the parser and the parser will be able to process the answers. So the processing the answers I will then do in the handle packet. So I could test this now because if you have a look here, I'm going to have a header, I'm going to have an answer. My header could check the response code. Then I can skip all the answers and then I can check the authorities. So if I want to check the authorities, I need to skip the answers. If I then want to check on the additional resources, I need to do skip authorities. So that's how it goes. You go down the packet by getting the questions, then the answers, then the authorities, then the additional records. So let's test it by running the test. If something goes wrong, you can always do a debug test to see. New outgoing DNS query for com on these servers and my test is passed. If your test wouldn't complete and you have exactly the same code, also check whether you actually are allowed to contact the root server directly. Maybe your internet provider would forbid that by blocking port 53, for example, to anything else than their own DNS servers. That is a possibility, a remote possibility, but most of the internet providers just allow DNS because you also have Google's and Cloudflare's public DNS servers. So that should, in general, that shouldn't be really a problem. If you get an error or panic, have a look at the code, whether you did something wrong, different, and you can, of course, use the debug test. So it's not much happening here. We are just doing a test and here we are checking whether we are getting the answers and we're getting some answers. So I could actually output the, the parse authorities just to see if it actually is working. Parse authorities. And then run this. And then I have the parsed authorities. So we have the header, name, type, class, time to live, and the length. So we have the name com and the NS records. So here we have all these NS records for the com domain name so that we know what the name servers are for the .com top level domain name. You could also change this into google.com, figure out what the name server is for google.com and then use the server name server google.com here and then you could do it query on Google as well. So then that could work as well if you want to test. So test outgoing DNS query just makes with net dial a connection to the server or to the list of servers and then writes our message. This is our message with our questions and then parses the DNS message using the parser. We parse the questions already in our function, which we don't have to do. I'm just doing it here. You can also just return the parser without doing this. And then you have to also parse the questions every time you are calling this outgoing DNS query. So it's up to you whether you want to do that or not. And then to test, you can run the test. And if your test succeeds, if it passes and you can print 
the authorities, for example, and you get something, then we have made a call to another DNS server. So this will be a building block for when we are going to handle an incoming packet in our DNS server, when we are going to run as a server, because when we have a request for, for example, google.com, we will have to first contact the root server. The root server will tell us where the .com top level domain server is. Then we can ask this server where google.com is. Then we can do a DNS query to the google.com DNS server. And every time we are making a DNS query, we are going to use this outgoing DNS query function. So this function is quite important to have this one working first. And the next step is going to be to write our server. Let's now start writing our resolver. So here I'm again in Visual Studio Code. We wrote our outgoing DNS query. Now we have to start a server and then write this handle packet so that we can run another test our test for test handle packet, where we try to resolve google.com and amazon.com. We are going to put these in a DNS message. It's going to be the header. It's going to be the questions. So name type, an A record we're going to ask. We are going to pack this into a byte slice, and then we're going to send this to a handle packet. So we use a mock packet connection. So because we are not really initiating a real connection, our IP address is going to be localhost. And then we're just going to send our buffer, which is this DNS question. If this all goes well, then our test works. We might want to write some other tests though, because this test is just going to test the handle packet. You might also want to manually test a few things how do you test whether our DNS server works? On Mac or Linux, you can use dig. Dig with at and then the name server that you want to use. And then for example, google.com. Nothing is running yet, so it will not work. With NSLOOKUP on Windows, you can use NSLOOKUP. And you can, for example, say I want to resolve google.com on the name server 127.0.0.1 and the same on Linux as well. If you want to resolve google.com, you can also do that on 127.0.0.1. So there are tools on your machine that you can use that are installed by default or that you can install. For example, dig, you can install both on Windows and on Linux and on Mac. And NSLOOKUP should be default on Windows. And NSLOOKUP also has an interactive shell where you can just type requests. It is something like nslookup and then you just don't enter the host name and then the name service 127.0.0.1 and then you're going to end up in a shell in Windows. There's also nslookup on Linux and on Mac but I never really use it. Maybe it is even a bit compatible. I often use dig or host. So this is how you test in a shell, but if you don't have any tools, you can also use test handle packet, which tests this handle packet. You could even write your own test here that is going to do an outgoing DNS query on your own server. That could also be a possibility. So you could actually also write everything in Go. So these are our tests. We don't have to really look at it straight away. We can first start writing a little bit of code and then we can enter debugging, for example, to see how it goes. Or just what I also do is a lot of print lines to see what the actual content is when we are then using the command line tools to do manual DNS queries. So let's get started with the server. So starting DNS server, and now we need to start it for real. I'm going to use the net package, listen, packet, the listen packet function, listen packet announces on the local network address, and then we can process the packets. The network is UDP and the address is 
just 53. So we're going to listen to all the IP addresses that we locally have. And this is going to give us a packet connection and an error. Packet connection, error. What if there is an error? If there is an error, I will just panic for now. It's plain simple so that we also get the error message. We want to defer packet connection close. So at the end of the function, we want to close the socket that we opened. And then we're going to have a loop, a for loop. So we're going to read the bytes, if there are bytes coming. And if there are bytes coming, we're going to put them in a buffer. And then we're going to trigger a handle function. This handle function, this handle packet is local, so we're going to create another one. Four, and then let's make a new buffer of type bytes. Packets are never going to be bigger than 512, so we can put just 512 here to make it ourselves easy. Packet connection read, read from, reads a packet from the connection, copying the payload into P. Our payload is going to be the buffer, and then it returns the number of bytes read, the network address, and an error. So bytes read, the address, and an error. What if there's an error? We can just print something, read error from the address, and this is the error, address, string, this is going to return as address in a string, and the error. And then we just want to continue, because then we can just continue the for loop. If there's no error, then what we can do is we can use this handle packet. But if you would use this handle packet, then we are not going to go back to our for loop because then we will be then we would be executing that function. So what we want to do is we want to use a go routine here so that we return back into our loop and then we will be blocking here. We will be blocked here until there's not a client that has sent us some data. And if there's not a client that sent us some data, then we will again execute this go routine in the background. So we are going to create a go routine for every client that is connected and that sends us a package. So for that, we need another function, handle packet. And it is also in a package, the DNS package. So I need a capital H to make it accessible. And a go routine is not going to return anything. So handle packet. Go handle packet. What are the parameters? My packet connection, the address, and the bytes. Packet connection, the address and the bytes. The bytes are in the buffer. How many bytes am I going to pass? All 512. No, I only want to pass the bytes that I have read. So I can say from the beginning to the bytes read. Go DNS handle packet. It's going to be, and then it's going to be importing my DNS start slash PKG DNS. So now, this should be all the code I need in my main.go. And now I can go to my resolver.go. And then here I can say if a handle packet, which returns an error, same parameters. If the error is not equal to nil, then I'm going to just print something so that I have something on screen. Handle packet error. Maybe I will pass also the address so that I know, and that is going to be the error. 
the address string and the error. Save this. Maybe I want here as well a return at the end. Handle packet, handle packet. So now this is the only code that we have to write outside our test. All the other code can go straight into this handle packet. So let's have a look in this handle packet. What do I receive? The DNS packet. How do I parse this? I'm going to use the DNS message to parse this packet. And then I can say p start of whatever is in my buffer. And it's going to give us a header and an error. And if you have an error, I will just return it. Now that we have started parsing this DNS message, I can extract one or more questions. P has all questions, which is a DNS message question slice or just question. For simplicity now, I will just assume that there's only going to be one question, but we can also do all questions and then we can have another loop. But I will keep it simple for now. So we're going to say P question. So the question is P question and also returns an error, I think. Question and error. If there's an error, I will return it, the error. And now we know that here we have a question. Now we can see what is in this question. So it's going to be a host name, a type, and a class. And that is our question that we have to solve. What is the type, the A record of a certain host? So we're going to use a separate function for that. We're going to do a DNS query and we're going to query a specific server with our question. So we're going to have a question and we're going to have a server or servers what servers are we going to use? Well, the first time we're going to run this is going to be the root servers. But we still need to parse this, so I will also make a separate function for that, get root servers. So we're going to do a DNS query, a function that we still have to write. And we're going to pass the server that we want to query and the question that we have. Once this is done, we will have a response, maybe an error as well. And that response we then can send back to the client. So how do we send it back to the client? If we have a response, well, let's first fix the error. If there's an error, we're going to return it. Let's say we already have our answer, our response. What's going to be the format of this? It's probably going to be a DNS message and then maybe just a whole message. That's what we want to construct in our DNS query. And then we can easily send it back to our client. So what is special about this is that we have to use the same ID. We have here this header with an ID in that is randomly generated by a client. So what we want to do is when we send a response, we want to make sure that this ID is the same. So DNS query, let's try to write our function for this. DNS query, get root servers. We can reuse this. It's going to be always an IP address. We're going to have a question. So this is the same, we're going to have a question. That we're going to want to pass the question here is of type DNS message question. What are we going to return? We want to return a full message DNS message message. So it's going to be a full message that we want to return so we can send it back to our client. And then we're going to have also maybe an error. 
So I'll just return nil nil so we don't have any compile errors. Then we have the response, which is DNS message. So if there's an error, we return the error. Get root servers. Maybe you should parse this first. So this needs to be a net IP address. So let me write this first. Get root servers. Maybe all the way at the bottom. Get root servers. And we're going to apply a net IP slice. Root servers is strings split. I'm going to split this root servers. It's comma separated. And then we can loop those root servers. And then we just need to create a new IP address for every root server. The net package has parse IP, which takes a string. The root server is a string. And then we need to put this in root servers. You now I will call these root servers our net IP. And then I will just move this here. So our root servers are net IP slice, and then we just need to append it. So now we convert our strings that we split into a net IP. Return root servers. So now we have a slice of net IPs with IP addresses of our root servers. So get root servers, and then we have the response. What are we going to do with this? First, we need to make sure that our response header ID is the same as our header ID, because the client sent us a DNS packet with a specific header ID, a DNS header ID, and we need to, when we send the response, have the same ID. And now we could send this to the client. Our response is still in the DNS message format, so we need to do response pack and it will return the bytes. So if you say this is our new buffer, do I need to make a new buffer for that? Response buffer error. If there's an error, we return. And then we have this net packet connection that we can use. PC write to. We can write the response buffer. Where are we going to write it to? To the address that we also passed here. This is a client address. And then we have the bytes returned. I don't think we need these bytes returned. We just need to make sure that if we have an error that we pass error and then return nil. Save this. So then we just have to write our DNS query function, which is going to be very long and complex. So to try to see if the code that we have written works, let's try to return a simple DNS message. An error, for example. So our DNS message is going to contain a header. And remember, this header also has in this DNS message header field. Should I put returns? Probably yes. We have this R code. R code is a response code. And what if we just send a failure, our code server failure. So we have a server failure. Then at least we are responding something back to the client so that when we have a packet that comes in, we can see if it gets parsed, if we get the questions, and then we can do the DNS query. Now that we also have the questions, let's just also print out the questions that we have to verify whether we can actually see something question because we only parsed one question. So now we can actually test this. 
easily. We could actually write a unit test of this handle packet with a little bit more simpler names. We could do a test handle packet and see where we get the right code back. We could actually use this test, I think, because we are not really checking on errors. We're just checking whether, whether this handle packet does return any errors. And will it return errors? No, it will not return errors, I think, because we will just send something back to the client, a server failure. So let's maybe do the unit test first, and then let's do it using the command line. Okay, so this worked. We have printed the question, google.com, type A, amazon.com, type A, and it just passes because we are not really checking whether the packet that comes back contains the answer that we are looking for. We are just, just simply checking whether we are not getting any error. So that works. Now let's try to run our server. Starting the DNS server, I'm going to open a new shell. And now we can use dig or nestlookup or host. Dig, I'm going to use dig first. So dig at 127.0.0.1. And then I'm going to try google.com. And what did I get? Status serve fail. So I did actually get a server fail. So my server is running. I got a response because let's try actually first what happens if there's no server running. You see, nothing happens. I cannot connect, it will time out. Then I can run the server and then you will see immediately the question coming up because Dick keeps on retrying. Dick keeps on retrying, which can also be annoying at some point. So you can also put it off. There's something like tries, tries. So if you do dig plus tries is one, there will only be one try. Tries one. I'm querying my local host, google.com or xyz.com. And then here I'll get google.com and xyz.com. So our server works. We are able to handle packets. We are launching GoRoutine for every packet. We are parsing our question that works. We are starting the DNS query function with our root service with our question. We are printing the question, but we don't have any other code. So we are sending a server failure. And then it goes back here. We fix the header ID. We package our response into bytes and we send the bytes back to the client. And then our client is actually getting a serve fail. So how does it actually look with other clients? So if you would use host, host google.com 127.0.0.1. You also get the surf fail. So Google not found surf fail. Let's try with NS lookup. How does it work? I haven't actually used it before. Yeah, it's the same. So NS lookup and then NS lookup you can use on Windows. I wonder whether it actually, it's actually the same behavior. So yeah, if you use NS lookup dash 127001, then you can just type uh, your host name that you want and then make sure that the server that you're querying is then 127001. So that all works. You can use dig, host, NS lookup, connect to our server, or you can use the unit test here. Benefit here is that you can do debugging. So I can say, I want to know what this ID is. So I put a breakpoint. I run debug test. And then I have my debugging console. So what is the ID? The ID is this hexadecimal number. How does my 
response look like it's a message with headers these are the headers there's no and there's no answer there's only this serve fail where is the serve fail the r code r code server failure and then i can actually continue to see what happens and then it does the same for amazon because we have a loop here so we can actually continue here and then we are doing the same for amazon and then it stops and here's my output and it passes so multiple ways to test this which is going to be necessary because you want to test this all the time every time you write some code you want to see if it is working so next we are going to write this dns query this will be the actual meat of our resolver this is where we're going to do our resolving for real before we continue let's have a look where we are so we did the listen to udp socket on port 53 we tested whether a client can connect we have a new packet that we then send to the handle packet function we parse the question we didn't send it to the root server yet that's going to be the next step we actually just returned an answer after the parse question back to the client to test whether that works so what we're we going to do now is we're going to enter our for loop and our for loop is going to query the server first the root server we're going to check whether the answer is authoritative if yes then we can send the answer back if not then we're going to have to parse the authorities check whether there's an ip address yes or no and then query the new server and continue this loop to make sure that if i would write a mistake somewhere that we don't end up in a loop querying one of these root servers i'm just going to also limit the for loop to let's say three or five loops so if something goes wrong and we write the wrong code then at least we are not hitting one of these servers with dns packets as fast as we can so we are going to limit our for loop and that should be it so we just have to write what's in the for loop here and that's going to be that's going to be this code because the previous slide actually doesn't show everything here we have then whether our ip address is included so we're going to parse these additional resources where we can find potentially an ip address so it's a little bit more complex but should be doable it is surprisingly not a lot of lines of code because we can use this dns message package we don't really have to worry about the dns packet itself so let's get started let's clear our screen a little bit we will not need this for now dns query this should be a for loop you can leave the print for some time then afterwards you can remove it for i is zero as long as it's less than three let's increase it and then we are in our for loop and the first thing we have to do is we have to do a dns query we have this outgoing dns query function that we have written so we're going to do outgoing dns query our servers our question and it's going to return the parser parser an error what is the parser it is actually the dns answer i will call it outgoing dns query and there's also the header so the outgoing dns query if i scroll down here we do a skip all questions so now i can actually parse immediately the answers so we can say first let's handle this error dns answer dot get all all answers 
these are all the answers. So these are the parsed answers. We'll also have an error if there's an error in the parsing. And let's maybe start with the end of our loop, which will not happen at this point, but the most easy part is if the header says that it is authoritative, then we can actually just send back a message, the DNS message. We have a header, DNS message header. Here we put the ID, so we only need to put that we now have a response. And then the answers, what is the answer? Well, we have the parse answers here. We can just say answers is parse answers. Is there an error? No, there's no error. And actually, my return error here is also wrong. So here return nil error, and here we return the error message. So if our answer is that we get from the DNS server is authoritative, then we can just return the message with the answers. And then we just make sure that the ID is correct here and that should work. But this is only going to work at the end. It's not going to work when we are just querying the root servers. What are the root servers going to do? The root servers are going to tell me if it is not authoritative, it's going to have in this DNS packet the authoritative name servers. So we should parse those. And those would also be in this parser, DNS answer, authorities, all authorities. And this returns a resource, authorities, error, if there's an error, we exit. So this is of type resource. This is of type resource. What is a resource? Resource has a header and a body. So we will need to parse this body as well. Resource header, the name, a type, class and then a body. So name is going to be the actual name. So let's output what is actually in there or let's use debugging to see what is, what is actually in there so we know how to parse this. So this is authorities and it's a slice so we will have to for sure loop them and actually what we can also do is just output them. So we can use debugging or just output it. What is in there? Maybe I will just output it. Authority. But what if there are no authorities? So just in the case that there are none, let's write a check. So if there are no authorities, then it will be zero. If it is zero, then we can send a message back. Server failure. What else do we have? Refused, not implemented, format error, name error. It's probably not really a name error. We will need to have a look at the DNS specification, what exactly we would have to return here. But let's keep this for now. You can, all, you can always look it up later. Let's keep this for now so that if our authorities would be empty for some reason because we wrote something wrong, then at least we know that we, we see this name error here. Let's try to run this. Go run cmd main.go and Let's use dig, tries one of google.com. And just to make sure we are going to query three times. So let me just break here so we don't query three times. 
uh, unconditionally terminated just for now. And then we return the server failure code. So we don't query three times. So we get the server fail, but what we get here is more interesting. So what do we get? New outgoing DNS query for google.com. These are the root servers. And what is in this authority? Header name com, name server, TTL, and then the body. Length 20. But that's here, this length is because the, in the DNS packets, it doesn't want to repeat always the same name. So there's some optimization going on. But let's have a look what is in these bodies. I think we can do it like that. And then we have the must new name. And then we have the names of these name servers. So a g t l d servers.net and so on b c d e f. So this we want to save in a variable. So we're gonna have name name servers make what is it going to be a string the size len authorities. I don't really like this go string here. It doesn't really show exactly the name. It shows how it looks in Go. So it's an NS resource. So we just need to check exactly what the type is. So if authority header, what is in the header? We have a type. And the type is of DNS message type. If this is equal to type NS, then we have an NS type, and then we can for sure know that the authority body is of type DNS message NS resource. And when we know it's the NS resource, then we have NS, and then we can do a string. This will give us the NS string, which is going to be this. This we can add to the name servers. So now that we have sized it correct, we, we can do it like this. We don't need to append because this starts from zero. And then we already right sized it right here. So now we have all the name servers. Could check again if that's exactly what we have. Name servers. Yeah. Those are the name servers, but we don't have the IP addresses yet. So we would have to now check where we have these IP addresses. And these are going to be in another place within the same DNS packet. These are going to be in DNS answer, the additionals. The additionals is going to give us these additionals and an error if there's an error. And these additionals we can loop again. So just like we did here, additionals, additional, it's a resource. What is the type of this additional? Hmm, we don't know yet. Let's comment it out. Let's have a look what is in there. So you can also just use debugging. I'm just gonna print it. What is in these additionals? I can remove this. Do another query. It says header, the name, and then we have type A. This is IPv6, this is IPv4. You're gonna keep it simple, so let's use IPv4. And then the body is going to be the IP address. So the additionals are going to have the IP addresses. So if the type is, what's the type here? Type A. Then 
what can I do with this? I can put this in a variable resolver servers, which is going to be an IP address. So this is type A, and I just need to use append now because I don't know how many there are going to be. But I should probably shouldn't shouldn't just add all these IP addresses because who knows what can be in there. So let's compare them with the authority and only when the name matches with an authority, then we're gonna add it. Authorities, if authority, authorities, no name servers. We can loop over the name servers because it's already a string. So only when the additional header name, I have it from here, header name string is equal to the name server, then let's append to these resolver servers the IP address. And how do we know the IP address? So we know that this is type A already. So we have the additional. Additional has a body. The body only has this go string. So here we used NS resource and here it will be the type DNS message A resource. A resource because the type is A. You can also just print the go print output and it will also tell you that a, re a resource. And then it has an A record and then it can return the bytes. So here we have the bytes. And that we should be able to just add to the IP because the IP is also bytes. Now that we have all these ifs, we also want to make sure that we know whether we have found IP addresses, we can say new resolver servers found is false. And here we can say true. So that at least we found one. And then if you didn't find any, then we can do something. But if we found IP addresses, then we can actually do a query by iterating our loop again. And then we just need to change the servers. Question can stay the same. We can just change the servers. Now the service is the service from here, which is the root servers. Now we can actually say the servers is the new resolver servers. And maybe I should just have called these servers, servers. Then I don't need this line because then we are just changing this servers. So servers, we make it empty. And then this needs to be servers and this needs to be servers. So if we do the iteration, then we say servers is going to be these new servers. If you don't have any new servers, then we're going to break for now. And then we're going to end up here because we haven't implemented this yet. If we have found new servers, then we'll just go to the next iteration loop. So let's try to test that. So let's click clear our screens. Maybe remove any prints. Yeah, there's no prints anymore. Let's see if that works. Go run. And what do we have? Starting DNS server. The first question is for google.com. Google.com 
there's a new outgoing DNS query to the root servers. The root servers returned these new NS records. We assign this to the servers. We do a new iteration. The new outgoing query is still for google.com, but now we have different servers. And we keep on iterating on this until we have found an authoritative server. And then once we find it, we return the message. And then actually we got the message. There's no error. We got google.com and the IP addresses. So maybe it is a bit unclear. So let's run the resolver test in debug mode so that we can have a better look at how this works. So the first outgoing query, we have an answer. So this is going to be the answer of the root servers. And this is the message. Let's have a look at this answer. It's not authoritative, so we are getting all the authorities. And these are these are these names. So let's continue a bit. So now we are figuring out what the name servers are. A G T L D. So we're gonna fill this name servers, and then we're gonna do the same for the IP addresses. So let's continue here to the next loop. Oh, actually, I see what I did wrong. I should put my breaking point here. So let's restart. Actually, let's just maybe remove amazon.com just to make sure that I'm not accidentally getting in that one. So I'm gonna stop, debug. So how many questions do we have before we get the answer? One, two, three. And these are the servers, root servers, GTLD servers, and then the Google name servers. These are the Google name servers. And then at this last iteration, we actually get the authoritative answer. So that's the third one. And then here we parse the answer and here we are authoritative. So the answers are now coming from these servers, which are the name servers. So first the root servers, GTLD servers, so the .com top level main servers, and then the Google servers and the Google servers are authoritative and then we are responding. So this works, but what is not going to work if we don't have any resolver server found. If you say resolver server not found, and let's uncomment amazon.com. And Amazon currently doesn't have any IP addresses for their name server, because why don't they have that? They have another domain name, you see, so it's not the amazon.com domain name. And when you ask the .com, .com servers, they will only give you these host names. So if you run our test again, resolver server not found for Amazon. So we don't get a reply. We get these host names right here, but we don't get the IP addresses. So we are here. We get these additionals. There's nothing in them. The new resolver found is still false. So we are now here. So for google.com, we actually have it working, but for amazon.com, it doesn't work because we didn't complete this flow. So remember the slides, I have two flows, one that we check whether we have the IP address and one that we don't check whether we have the IP address. Google is one server because we have here google.com and it's one google.com and we cannot look that up. So we have the IP addresses in the additionals. For amazon.com, we can actually do a lookup of these host names to figure out what the A record is and then reply the A records and then use the A record as a server. But that requires a little bit more code right here. So let's try to add 
the necessary code just right here. You can actually write this code in two ways. You can say, I have these name server records here, and I'm going to loop over them for name server, range name servers. And I'm going to say, I'm going to find all the IP addresses of the name server. This might be a little bit inefficient because we only need one working name server. So if you have one IP address, we might have enough. Now, we might have an IP address that doesn't work. So then we would be in trouble. So if you have one IP address and just hope that IP address works and return that IP address back in our loop here as a server, or we can get all IP addresses. So it's up to you whether you want to write it efficient or not. If you want to write it in a way that you get all the IP addresses, it is actually possible that if you would write a caching resolver, that these IP addresses are already cached anyways in your resolver so that the latency that you get by resolving all these name servers is not completely crazy. But yeah, you can already see one, two, three, four, five, six. Are we going to look up six host names to figure out all these IP addresses, whereas maybe one name server would be enough? It's up to you. I might just actually look up one. If I find an A record of one, I will just return that. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to use again this if here. If new resolver is not found, then I'm going to continue in this loop. And once I have found one, I will just put this to true. And what I'm going to do now is that I actually need to restart this whole loop again. I need to run this DNS query just like I run it here, this DNS query. Because if I just run one query, that's not going to be enough. I need to run multiple outgoing queries because we have to start again with the root servers. The root server is going to say NS servers for .NET are going to be here. Then you're going to have the name servers of this Dynac.net or this UltraDNS.net. And then you're going to have the A record. So I'm going to have to recursively go into this function again to find the IP address of this host name here. So DNS query gives us a message, a response an error, and I need to get the root servers again because I need to query the root servers and then I can pass a question. So DNS message question. The name is going to be the name server, but actually the name is of type DNS message message. So there's a must new name that can convert a string into a name type. So must new name name server. The type is going to be the A type type A because I'm looking for an A record and the class is going to be Enet class. If there's an error, if there's an error, I'm just going to print something, a warning, lookup of name server failed, and an error. And if there's no error, then I'm going to do something else. So that means that if there's an error, we'll just continue the loop until we find a name server that works. If we find a name server that, name server that works and we have an A record, we can put this to true. The response will then have the answers and we'll have to loop those because it's a slice. So for answer range answers. So this is a message actually. So the DNS query, it's a message. We don't have a parser, so we don't need to parse these things because it is actually the message that is being returned from hopefully here. If we are authoritative after we went through the loop a couple of times, we're going to have these answers here. 
So for answer, what do we need from the answer? This is going to be our IP address. Could be multiple IP addresses. So if answer header type is type A, is type A, I get a warning here, I didn't add error. If it is type A, what do we do? Then we can say servers, which is now empty. Append servers and our answer body should contain a type A, so it's an A resource, just like here, an A resource. And this should be the IP address. If this doesn't work, we'll see, but normally we are testing DNS message type A, so this is for sure going to be an A resource. We return the IP, we append this to servers, and then we can do the loop again. I don't think I am missing anything. There's still this break here. Do we still need this break? No, we don't need this break anymore. Although before we are going to do all these crazy things, maybe we should just say IPs found to see whether it's really working. IPs found servers and then we do a break and what about that i can live with that so let's try to do that so google.com that works because we didn't really go in that loop amazon.com ips found okay new outgoing dns query for pdns1 ultra dns so we found i hope the correct ip address for ultra dns Yes, that seems to match. Let's remove this breaking point. And let's hope for the best. And we get an answer. Amazon.com and the A record is right here. Yeah, that seems to match. They're just in a different order. So this was our last step. If there is no A record provided, then we need to resolve it by running our DNS query again. And then after coming back here using the new servers, we have an authoritative answer and then we return the correct message. So this seems to work. Let's, to be sure, also run our unit test. And that also seems to work. So. How many lines of code do we have? Less than 200. Okay, but we also have the main function, but our library, less than 200 lines, and we have written a DNS resolver that is actually working for simple queries. It definitely could use some improvements, some more checks, some more tests. We can, for example, also test whether we can run a max records so host google.com is handled by smtp google.com and now if we ask our own server using domain server the localhost one then we also get mail is handled by smtp google.com so that seems to be working you can do the same with dick you just have to do dick minus type i think type equals mx. So within 200 lines, you can write yourself a DNS server in Go using only this extra package that is still from golang.org. So it's actually maintained as well. It doesn't have the same promises as these built-in packages, but these are pretty stable and pretty high quality because you can see that they are very efficient in parsing these DNS packets. So you can play a little bit with it, 
to see if it works for all cases or that it works for a domain name that you own. But for simple queries, it seems to be working. So our resolver can answer simple queries. It doesn't catch anything yet. So you see it does for every query a lot of DNS queries itself. So that means that it wouldn't be very useful to use this as a real resolver. You would still have to write a caching layer that takes into account the TTL as well to cache the host names. I will make these files available on my GitHub so that you can have a look at the solutions and hopefully also try to build it yourself and improve on it.